Today's show is brought to you in partnership with Clear Motive Marketing. I co-founded this high-impact creative agency over 15 years ago to help clients just like you. Marketing leaders that have small teams and large organizations that are often under-resourced and accountable to a multitude of stakeholders. You're executing campaigns every day, all day, and held accountable for everything from immediate delivery to real-time results. It's nearly impossible to do it all well. Clear Motive exists to help you deliver high-quality, high-quantity creative on time, on budget, day after day. You expect great ideas and incredible creative from a national agency. What you may not expect is simplified workflow, modern technology to speed up projects, and activities that achieve higher returns. If you're not getting the consistent results you need, I can help. Reach out to me on LinkedIn or check out clearmotive.ca. Hello and a warm collisions YYC. Welcome to my guest this morning, Ms. Tara Langan. How are you doing, Tara? I'm good, Tyler. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming on. I don't even remember how we met. That's Calgary. That's the ecosystem. That's the world we live in. It's one. It's the biggest small town ever, as everyone has heard me say many times. I love it. Um, you and I crossed paths. I remember we had a great conversation. I had some notes, but I want to dive right into it. You are the owner at Career TLC. So let's jump in the old elevator. Hi, Tara. So good to meet you. What's, what's Career TLC about? What do you do? What problem do you solve? And what gets you out of bed in the morning? <laughs> Well, thanks for asking, Tyler. <laughs> I, um, I sparked Career TLC, and just as it sounds, you know, it really is about offering people resources and supports that they need to thrive at work. So, on one side of my business, I'm coaching mid career professionals in their career transition. Um, I'm also coaching neurodivergent professionals that maybe don't fit in the workplace right now or are struggling um, to kind of like be comfortable in their current work environments. On the other side, I support organizations in learning a little bit more about neurodiversity through real storytelling and helping to support them on building neurodiversity into their current diversity inclusion plans. So yeah, as it sounds, I've got like a lot of love to give and a lot of knowledge to give, um, but it really is about taking care of people um, in our modern day workplace. Amazing. Uh, that was that was a night. That was a very pleasant. This has been a very pleasant elevator ride we're in this morning. Well, since we have many more floors to go, I'm going to keep asking. Well, let's. I never want to assume. And part of my podcast is to go. People go, huh? I didn't really know or understand that. Talk to us a little bit about neurodivergence. What does it mean? What does it represent in the context of the workplace? But let's level up the audience for for a minute and let let's get all on the same page of what we're actually talking about here. So I'll turn it back to you to kind of walk us through a little bit. When I think when I hear neurodivergent, what should I be thinking about? What does that represent to an individual in the workplace? Yeah, for sure. So I guess I'll start, I'll wear my HR hat here and share that, okay. you know, for, for years, we've been coming up with diversity inclusion plans to create these cultures of belonging in our workplace based on what we can see, right? Um, it could be race, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, and we've kind of forgotten about the differentiation, the differentiation in our brains. So neurodiversity is a new concept. It's actually um, in aligned with the neurodiversity movement to support that there's a natural variation in how we think, feel, experience, and sense the world around us. Now, if you're neurodivergent, some folks might identify with being autistic, have ADHD, have dyslexia, dyscalculia, learning um, disabilities, a number of other things that sometimes we're not always able to um, see in a person. And so the neurodiversity movement really does normalize the fact that, you know, if we were to put five people in an elevator with us today, this morning, for example, Tyler, some of us would have palms sweaty. We would be having an anxiety attack. We probably would be like, I don't want to ride with Tyler and Tara at all. I just want to get to work. And that is it. And then others are going to ride that, that elevator totally smooth. So it's also considering again, like sensory considerations. And just how we're all buried and how, how all of our brains work. I love it. I love the simple, what we can see versus what we can't. And there's such an easy, like, well, if we can't see it, is it real? Is it, I don't know. And that's all, oh, that's fluffy stuff. We don't worry about that. And I feel we're kind of moving back more to, well, what about the individual? What about the, what about the human in this, in the, in this experience? And is this from... I'm thinking about this as a movement. Like I love what you said about we spent so much time on what we can see and the visual, like you're different. And then, you know, how are we treating you and versus this movement, where's this sparking from? Is it just because we're be, we're just becoming more conscious as organizations or as human beings, or is, is, was there a line in the sand where this all of a sudden started to be like, Hey, wait a minute, we're, we're forgetting about this whole other group here just because it's not recognizable at a glance. Yeah. 
I mean, to a certain extent, I think arguably all of us are different. So as a society, we are neurodiverse, different brains. I think where this is coming from is there's a, a little bit of a shift from the medical model of disability to the social model. And what I mean by that is the medical model kind of supports that, you know, it's disorder, deficit. It really focuses on some of the, the medical um, components of somebody's neurology versus the social model really moves us to what are some adjustments in our everyday society that can be made to support the person. So I can tell you as somebody who has ADHD, some individuals in our society will say, I am disabled, I have a disability. Other people will not identify with that at all. They'll say, no, I don't have a disability at all. I feel like there's components in society that could change or shift that would enable me to be more successful. When I hear disability, I'm again putting my own words on it and I might get it wrong and that's okay. I'm so willing to lean in and have the conversation. Disabled against this is how the norm, how we've normalized the way something is done. But really you're just talking about the fact that that individual processes that information or deals with it or assimilates it or communicates it in a different way. But because it's different than the mass way we've decided is the right way, that's the only part that makes it a disability. Is, is, is my, am I paraphrasing that wrong or am I, or am I oversimplifying something much more complex? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think on the retirement, I think we should break it down even and talk about, we can't really talk about neurodiversity without talking about something called neuronormativity. Okay, okay. so mm. let, let's make an assumption that we do have people in this world that are autistic, have ADHD, dyslexia, have a number of different learning disabilities. Um, neuronormativity is important to talk about here because neuronormativity really is the Sort of like our cultural norms, systems, things that we we imply every day that should just be easy and comfortable for the majority. So mm-hmm. some of these things can include like our own hustle culture. It can include that, you know, you should be expected to be in a back-to-back meeting where your calendar looks like a game of Tetris, right? Like no breaks in between. Um, you know, an interview, um, Tyler's a really, really good example of something that's a neuronormative activity that we assume that when organizations in our, you know, tech sector or any innovation sector, any any company, to be honest, any industry, we're implying and assuming that a one-hour interview is the right way to do things. It's the right way to assess people through verbal interaction. Um, that we assume that our measure of likability is based on eye contact. And a good old solid handshake in terms of how we business, uh, how we relationship, right? Now, we know that there are neurodivergent professionals out there that absolutely can perform that job. And if they were given the opportunity to actually tangibly um, demonstrate that they can perform the work, they would. But because they're being tested for eye contact and some of those neuronormative ways of doing things, they're actually getting knocked out of the running. So part of this is, you know, I I like kind of where you were going with like, what is actually disabling us? Um, I would say that some of these neuronormative processes that have worked for the majority, if we look at a bell curve, we look at 80% are neurotypical individuals that have no problem processing, um, communicating in that manner. They're fine. It goes unnoticed. But for the 20% outsiders, and that's current current stats, um, they're struggling. They're not telling anybody in the workplace because they're scared. We're just getting the conversation started, but they deserve just as much opportunity to shine and showcase and communicate in the way they normally do as everyone else. I love, thank you for breaking that down. And it makes me think about the other stat that I don't know, which is the opposite of the individuals that are incredibly good at eye contact and handshake and connecting and actually are not that skilled at the job. And I think we've all as, as, as hiring as owners, hiring managers have made those mistakes. Like, Oh, this person's going to be great. <clears throat> but we were testing them for the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah. We tested them for how much we liked them and how great they were at talking to us and making us feel the way we felt. And we hire them going. And then, uh, Two months later, you're like, oh my God, this person can't do the job. <laughs> like they don't actually have the skill, but damn, I like them. 
<laughs> so dangerous to be armchair, you know, a psychologist. And I, I joke, I'm really, really good at judging character. If by chance that person shows up exactly how they are. Otherwise I can be misled as easy as the next person. <laughs> I think we've all, I think we've all had those hard lessons like, oh, wow, I completely misread that based on, I think what some of the things you shared that are just accepted is like, well, if you're good at these things, you must be a good, you must be good at the other things, which unrelated potentially. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, I dig that comment because there's such good self-awareness. And this is why HR is needed in the house sometimes, right? To kind of prompt managers on their unconscious or conscious bias. And the goal is always to get the best talent, right? But are we are we assessing the talent the right way? And I've spent years supporting leadership where I will I will ask them, you know, I've got that job posting in hand and I'm working with them on the interview. And I'll say, tell me about the Fit. Like, tell me about who's going to be a good fit for your team. And as they start talking, I'm kind of like, uh huh, that's you. Uh huh, uh huh. You're describing that's yourself. Like you. mm-hmm. <laughs> so how can and that's and that's one of the probably the yeah. biggest advantages of of really appreciating neurodiversity is that there's a ton of stats out there that supports that. You know, when you assemble teams with different minds, we have thirty percent more productivity, thirty percent more engagement. We will be working with people that are different than us. And, you know, another fun fact, we've got our Gen Z uh, generation coming in and they're all identifying with being 50%, at least 50% neurodivergent. So by 2030, we're going to have half the workforce that is identifying in some way or another. And again, this could mean that they're very openly to say, I have ADHD. This could be, um, you know, that they have other, other variations. like. I don't want ADHD and autism. They kind of get the limelight here, but the magnitude and variation of who we are is we're going to need different, different things now. And as different as, as, as you and I might be is if someone has ADHD, there's so many different levels, versions, like what's your version of it? How does it show up for you? It's not as easy as just picking a new set of labels to, and which we do because we shortcut because we're busy, right? <laughs> we sh- oh, ADHD, let's put all that in a bucket. But inside that bucket, there's probably, I wouldn't guess, and I, I can only imagine as much as every human is different, even if you suffer or, or experience, or sorry, I just, that's the wrong word, experience ADHD, it's going to be different than the person beside you who also potentially has it, correct? Like it's not even as simple as going, oh, we've got a new label that we can you, we can throw around in the office, yeah. which is also very dangerous. Very dangerous. Well, and you know what, Tyler, <laughs> you said suffer and then you backed up, but I'm going to pause. I there. did. I caught myself. I was like, that didn't feel right. I didn't like how that sounded not coming out of my mouth. Please you know what, tell though? me, was that good? Was that bad? <laughs> it's real. It's real. Okay. okay. I, Thank I'll, you. Speak, mm-hmm. I'll speak freely on behalf of myself here as someone with ADHD. Um, when I see it advertised as ADHD is a superpower, hiring neurodivergent talent is a competitive advantage, right? It kind of, you're kind of like, oh, like I know that I have strengths and skills, but it feels very exploitive, exploitive. And mm. I think for every single person, they're going to describe their experience very differently. So you're right. It's like when you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. When you've met one person who has ADHD, you've met one person with ADHD, but there are days where I I do feel like, man, it would be really nice if my brain would just like fire completely yeah. right now, right? Like this is really, really real for a lot of people. And um, the other thing that I would mention is there's what's called internalized ableism because um, when you've grown up thinking that we were all like little children at one time, when we grow up and we hear these messages to us in the school system, or we hear um, different comments about, you know, like, hey, settle down, or hey, sit down, or hey, stop moving, or hey, stop fidgeting, or hey, right? And then we grow up into these societies and in workplaces where it's expected, you know, pay attention in a full meeting, don't fidget and sit. And then all of a sudden, you're starting to really, you internalize, um, even maybe perhaps not asking for what you need because you feel ashamed, right? You feel kind of like mm. I must conform. And I, you know, I think I always joke about this when I facilitate, but it's like you sign the offer letter and it's like assimilate now. Nobody asks you about your learning style or who you are. And that's really where we need to get to. Thank you for, for grabbing onto that word and kind of unpacking it a little bit for me. Cause I said it and then I hesitated because I'm resistant labeling or putting my filter, or, you know, over, over simplifying. I'm going to go super boring here for a second. Back to put on, I'm going to put on your, I'm going to put on your HR hat, <laughs> the many, many hats that you have available to you. 
if I'm in an organization and you said about, oh, I start describing who's going to be the perfect person, I start describing myself, how important is the role description, the understanding, the task, what that person is actually going to be judged on, what accountability looks like? Is it still like in our organization, we used to be terrible at it and we've gotten a lot better at it. And we spent, and consequently, we spent a lot more time of what is the role description? What are the key results that we're going to focus on? What skills do they need to demonstrate to even be right for the job? But when we were earlier, we were running fast and everybody's in a rush, <laughs> speed, stop the glamorization of busy. I heard that one the other day. I really liked it. <laughs> oh, I'm so busy. Yes, yes, we know. And, and, but am I too busy to do it right? Often. So in this context, is that the safe place to start? And obviously it expands from there. This is, this is HR Tara. Yeah. That's yeah. I would say <laughs> recruitment is a really great start Tyler, for sure. Cause when we think about the employee experience and the journey, the first thing that I want to mention is attraction. So what are organizations, you know, for anybody listening on the call right now, how are you demonstrating to your own markets that you are neuro inclusive? Now, what would that look like? That probably looks like, do you have diversity um, on your website in some of your photos? Have you captured, um, you know, employee articles on the website that demonstrate that, you know, you value diversity of thought? Have you featured an employee? Most importantly, do you have an inclusion statement in your job posting? So, you know, do you have something indicating that we recognize the talent that we attract to our organization comes to us? in all different shapes and forms. And we recognize that neurodiversity is an asset. And we invite you to let us know if there are any accommodations or adjustments that you might need at the interview stage. And so I mentioned that attraction because that's so, so important from a a competition and a sustainability perspective that um, organizations are now wanting to see their current clients. Their, Their current clients should absolutely see themselves in the business. So that's, I think, the first thing. At the recruitment stage, I would invite everybody to check the interview away. I'm, I'm going to go there. I've done enough research as it relates to uh, autism to say, scratch that interview, get rid of it, get rid of it. Um, we've got companies that are using VR to do simulations. We've got Microsoft that is actually inviting people in to do um, assessments, game, like gamification, where they're actually going through Minecraft and they're testing team building, again, through nonverbal assessment, through Mm nonverbal assessment. So the best thing that our organizations and our leaders have right now listening on the call is to just quickly say to themselves, if not an interview, then what? How else can I sort of, knowing that there's a variation in how we all kind of communicate, how else can I offer an opportunity to somebody to showcase or demonstrate their skills that is not verbal? Yeah. Is the barrier to large enterprise, you mentioned Microsoft and everyone rolls their eyes and goes, of course, Microsoft, because they've got budget and they've got this, they've got resources. I'm a small business. I'm 50 people. I'm 200 people. I'm five people. Maybe five is almost easier because you can have, you you can, it's different. It's almost personal. It's when you get that that midsize, I find can get, because by then you have layers of process. You have, this is the way we do it. This is the way we've all, this is the way I did it at my last company. So this is the way I'm doing it here. And you just get into those repetitive patterns. Geez, if I just had time to make it better, I would, but I'll do that on the next hire. Mm -hmm. Is there like Jen, you said Gen X is 50%. There's a point where companies aren't going to have a choice here or else they're not going to be able to attract new talent. So it feels like we're getting sandwiched in between like, yeah, this might be a good idea. I don't have time. If I don't, I'm actually not going to be able to find new team members. It's so true. It is so true. And, you know, this is where creativity is such a beautiful thing. And this is also where involving your current workforce is a beautiful thing, whether you're a staff of five or 10. If global numbers are supporting that 20% of us are neurodivergent, We don't have to seek or quest what that means at this point. We don't, right? But we can fairly say as a leader, tech startup, whether it's seed or grown or fully grown, you can say, you know what? I'm going to hit the pause button for 10 to 15 minutes. I've got time for this. I'm going to round up my current employees and I'm going to say, we need a new way of doing things. We're not going to interview, but we need to figure out how can we actually assess this talent. Now, everybody in that workforce has gone through the process already and likely has ideas. So this brings us to like inclusive design, human-centric design. How do we build around people? How do we get the thoughts of people to provide that input? Um, 
the inter or the the actual job description, to be perfectly honest, is going to be really stale dated. And the other thing that we're not considering too is some people can't even read that text, right? They're not, they don't process text that way. So um, doing a video of what it's like to work for us, right? We want you to submit a video of what, of what your skills are. Um, that's one option. We want you to submit a video of you doing the work maybe, or um, performing the work. And I know that these are all like outside the box um, ideas, but there are other options other than the interview. My concern is I think if we continue to test people through just their ability to verbally communicate the how, a software engineer is a really good example here. We would say, Tyler, I want you to come in and tell me how you would hypothetically code. You probably bring you in to say, here you go, Tyler. Do you, do you think you can demonstrate your coding experience for us on the computer right now? Almost the, the, the audition. Um, <clears throat> and I love jobs where there is something you can see that they can physically do. We, we work with a lot of creatives and to your point, very similar. And I'm like, Hey, let's give them a test project. Like let's pay them to do the test project. Let's just see, like, let's, let's go on a few, you know, outings together. Let's, <laughs> you know, let's do, let's do a work project together in a short period of time and get, and we've got many more of our team members involved to just chat with them and talk about the work in a very non-formalized interview process. And our, success rate has improved. Like no, no question. And it's not even like, I love what you said about just pop on loom, make a video. The CEO could talk about, Hey, here's what it's like to work here. Send me back what you're looking for. Like there's so many of these tools that are also very accessible to your point with a little creativity. There's no barrier to what you can do once you decide that you want to do it different <laughs> in my mind. Yes. Yes. And be creative and all stages of that recruitment process um, matter. So yeah. I would say for anybody listening in summary, from attraction to recruitment to onboarding, what you're trying to do is you're trying to build processes that are multi-modality. So it's not a one size fits all that you're running everybody through. You're actually taking taking pause in how can we have our process um, and to diversify your talent, you must diversify your process, right? So how can we switch things up where we're giving people different opportunities to, to engage with us. Yeah. Maybe an obvious question, but clearly there feels like there's a risk here of we've got a great recruiting process. We tell a great story. This is who we aspire to be, but that's not actually how the operate, the organization functions when you get inside. It's like, so what, from your perspective, what are you seeing out there in terms of at a leadership level out of this? We, you said a comment earlier about we are looking and we embrace and we value diversity of thought. I can think of a few companies that I work with that they say that, but they actually don't. Yeah, it's diversity of thought as long as it's aligned with these three thought patterns and processes and probably individuals. Are you seeing a gap or, because obviously that's where it won't work in the long run, but our HR teams, just to pick on a group, becoming more aware of this at the risk that sometimes the organization itself doesn't actually function that way. Being that this is still early days as we're f like fumbling our way through. Yeah, and it is uncomfortable because we're, you know, I, I talk to a lot of HR people that they're like, do I need to be like a neuroscientist to understand this? And from HR's hat right <laughs> yeah. now, um, or shoes, they're like neurodiversity, yet another thing that I need to learn. Oh my gosh, right? So they're already sort of like the candling, like fairness and equity in the organization. For the leadership, the leaders um, have pride. Any leader is going to have pride. No, we're, we're great. We're good. Things are good. You know, I have visited plenty of like events where I've chatted with a lot of folks in industry, whether it be tech or engineering or IT. And yet, nope, nope, we've got a diverse inclusion plan and we're good. Everybody's here. Everybody's getting along. Yeah, for sure. It's good. It's good. Everything's good. And I would say that in some <laughs> professions, and I am going to pick on tech here a little bit, um, okay. we're head down, but, but like we're, we're head down, butt up. Like we are very like highly skilled technical labor that often, sometimes, not always, not trying to generalize here, but introverted, potentially um, very task technical, which means we're not really going to be the first to be like, hey, something's wrong. Yet, if you were to safely ask every workforce, hey, did anybody inquire with you ever about your learning style? Hey, just curious, how do you process information? We're just kind of taking note in the organization just to make sure that, you know, if there's assistive technology that you need or anything else. Um, hey, how, how comfortable are you just, um, you know, working at home? 
Like, do you, do you prefer like a mixed combination of hybrid, you know, what works for you? So my observation and why I'm doing some of the work that I'm doing is to truly normalize that whether you're neurotypical or neurodivergent, whether you're the CEO of the startup or whether you're the admin in an organization, every brain in that organization, every single person is going to have a different version of what sets them up for success. So when we talk about adjustments and, you know, if we were to be like workplace wizards and say, what do you need? I'm going to grant you some wishes. Um, everybody would say different things. You and I would say different things, right? Do you find, I love the question, like, what's your learning style? You, you know, how do you process information? Do you find, there's a time in my life where I probably wouldn't have known how to answer that question. I'm young, I'm enthusiastic, I'm full of whatever enthusiasm, like just let's, let's do it. Ah, bit of a wrecking ball. I don't know if I could have answered those questions. I think I could answer them now, but I respect how hard they are to answer now because I've done some of that work. But there's a period of time, like I roll into my staff and say, oh, hey, what's your, just curious, what's your learning style? I'm expecting I might get some blank answers sometimes. Like even that, what's, Talk to me a little bit about that dichotomy and are we getting better at learning and self-awareness as these things become more surfaced or circulated? Yeah. So my invitation here would be, you know, don't, no need to be fully like prescribed with having the right answer. Um, somebody, mm -hmm. somebody shared the other day, um, I think it was Jake with Next Gen Men um, speaking in draft, right? Like communicate in however fashion you, you feel you can convey your information. So I would say yes, when you're asked that, some people are like, I don't know how to, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. So there does need to, yeah. need to be a little bit of an explanation of, you know, do you audibly learn? So for example, if you're on a Zoom call, uh, when we're communicating verbally, what do you find yourself doing? Do you find yourself listening to the information and then writing things down as you're taking taking in the info? Do you find that you process information best in writing where you can sit back and read it first and then come at it from a different approach. For some people, they'll straight up tell you, Tyler, if you're talking to me verbally, um, if I have short-term memory, I'm not going to remember what you said to me, which is, which is again, why the interview is problematic because we're, we're sort of testing unusually their ability to like think on their feet quickly when in reality, the role back at work is going to invite them to have more time to conceptualize the plan. So it's interesting, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but getting people to start to convey in their own way. Yeah, I, I really prefer communication and writing. It gives me a chance to just take it in, read it, and then the respond to you. And appreciating that not everybody can process and respond within 24 hours and, and or whatever the, the expectation is. Well, sometimes in some cultures and, I, you know, I'm a quick on my feet thinker, which leads to you talk more in meetings, you come up with things quicker. It doesn't mean they're better things, but you, you are to come up with them on the spot. It's interesting. And I, I know that I value, have valued that over the years until I started to realize, oh, wow, if I just let this sit the next day, I might get that email from a certain individual that says, Hey, I thought about this. Here's what I think. And it might be more thought out. Not that the ideas are better or worse, but they come at different times, but it doesn't make them better or worse because of the timeline. <laughs> Don't mistake one for the other. And I've made that mistake before because I leave towards my own preferences yeah. over the years, which is maybe default. It's easy to do without a little like, oh, wait a second, sober second thought. Oh, I'm doing that thing again. Let's pause. Let's take yeah. a breath. <laughs> Self-awareness, you made the comment earlier, I think is the backbone of so much of this <laughs> journey for all of us, no matter where we sit on whatever whatever unique version of us we, that shows up at the office. Yes. That <laughs> and, being, and leaning into preferences um, is totally normal. It's now, you know, part of the reason why this neuroinclusion work is is needed is to really create heightened awareness of what others will experience. So another good example here in, in our um, our very like hustle and bustle culture and business and, and innovation is we will go and we'll network, right? We will network after work and we will have after work schmoozing events or whatever it is, right? And there is a large part of that um, audience that is either overstimulated while they're trying to relationship build, or they might have to just opt out because of some of the sensory hazards that are involved in that environment, right? Like maybe it's the lights, maybe it's the stimulation. Um, like some of this for some people 
can be very debilitating. Now, others on the call are going to say, well, listen, like I kind of enjoy my like after work beer. I'm not going to change that. I'm not saying change that. I'm just saying, could there be other options for that employee or several of them that again, you know, are impacted that way to just say, I'd really love to be a part of an event like that. I, I am social. I just am social in a different way. So are there other things that we can do or consider? Um, because we, we need also that diversity of thought at the table. So again, if it's the same process, the one size fits all, we're always only yielding that one size person that, that you know, um, versus diversifying people in the room. Which can often be the preferences of the leader, the manager, the person who's like, well, this is the way we do it. And that's the way I do it because that's default. And so many people get put into or rise to leadership roles without really having an understanding of what it is to be a leader. They were just very good at the task, which I think would compound potentially what we're talking mm-hmm. about here. And that's another, you know, so many people show up and, and, and show up in leadership roles because of their technical prowess, but they don't know how to communicate effectively. They've, ne- they've never had the training that even comes into close. I heard a quote yesterday. Um, from a guest that said she was, she was quoting someone else, but it was something to the effect of like, I look forward to the day that we've had, that we advance as far in how we treat each other in how much we've advanced with the technology that we use. And it was such an amazing statement because we get so prized by this tech and our prowess and how good we are at doing the thing. But what about how we interact with each other? (laughs) And oftentimes leaders don't get the opportunity to learn those skills as they work their way up the technical ladder, which I think would just compound what we're talking about. I see this a lot. And I've seen this in my career for sure is promotion on technical competency. And and here's the big reveal. Here's, here's like the big, the big, like, (laughs) get ready. This is, this is it. It is not just the employees that are neurodivergent. So I think we have to also wrap our minds around who's who in the room. We have leaders, absolutely, that are also neurodivergent, right? That are like essentially safe assumptions here. Every employee in the workforce is a different thinker, feeler, sensor, experiences everything different. But we have a large amount of leaders that are also working through maybe it's a late diagnosis, uh, you know, again, mm-hmm. ADHD or awesome. autism, they're finding their way. Maybe they haven't had um, um, exposure to the medical system to get a diagnosis because there's a long, long wait, yet they're struggling with their own kind of neurology and how they're or task planning and organizing. That might impact employees. Um, employees are trying to figure out how to work with their, their um, leaders. So it really... Everybody is an invested stakeholder when it comes to neurodiversity. Every single human in in the workplace is. And, you know, making broad sweeping a little bit here, but there's a whole group of, there's generations that this was, you just, you did not bring this up. You did not get, you did not go talk to someone. You did not get up. You just leaned in harder and did the thing. And there's so many people that I think have suffered in silence in the corporate world. We'll just use that as a term that have been, never had the opportunity or just was, it, you just didn't do it. It just wasn't done that way. And there was, and you know, I love our new world of let's be open, let's talk about it. But it is, it's a little bit new for a lot of individuals. I think it's just to your point, it's good to be respectful of that. Not everyone has been on, I might've been doing it the same way for 40 years. It was painful and it wasn't working for me, but I muscled through because I didn't have an option or I didn't feel I yeah. had an option. <laughs> and I do think it takes some personal storytelling. So if I can, if I can just share one of, of my own. Yeah. Please. Um, To normalize some of this, I think it takes people being brave and coming out and saying like, hey, here's who I am. I have ADHD or hey, here's who I am. And this is how I operate. And again, perhaps it's not even including a label. Um, But one of the things that I've I've struggled with is um, when you have ADHD, what I've learned about my own neurology is I will have trouble with task planning sometimes. Like task initiation is a real thing. And there's parts of my brain that just will not um, allow me unless I'm really keenly interested in what I'm doing. Like I will, I will be able to hyper focus on that, right? But for other things that I'm a little bit less interested in, my brain just sort of it, it takes a lot to to initiate. So as you know, in the workplace, we're tasked with all sorts of things, good and bad. Some are going to be of interest, some that we don't want to do, right? So there's people in our workforce that are like, oh man, I've got to do that. How am I going to? How am I going to figure this out? Anyway, I have had this same collection of mismatched socks in my bedroom for years. 
I've walked over this collection of mismatched socks for years. It's traveled with me in more than one bedroom and, and I've had more than one move. And I kind of got to a point where I'm like, I want to do something about these socks. Like, again, not an ounce of my brain wants to pick up these socks, put them together, fold them and put, put them in my dresser. Now, in the workplace, if I was, if, if this mismatched sock, uh, you know, pickup was like the business outcome, I would have people around me going like, come on, Tara, like, seriously, like, just pick them up. Like, what? Like, literally, let's go. Let's go. Like, how hard can this be? Right. Others are going to be like, move over. I'm just going to do this for you. Seriously, Tara. Like I can, you know, she is like so lazy. I don't know what's going on. She's dropping the ball in this project. Right. So I mentioned that because this is, this is really, really real. And what I had to do in this situation is be a self advocate. What does Tara need to actually get this done? So I hired a coach (laughs) and a coach helped me through a lot of like verbal dialogue on like, how is it going to feel when you pick up these socks off the floor? Um, this coach nudged me and said, hey, Tara, you know, outside of the coaching sessions, just a reminder, like, one's a great start. And so I mentioned this, Tyler, because if we don't have cultures of self-advocacy where the employee is an expert in how they operate and, and how, how their brains work, if we don't have cultures where employees can come forward and say, you know what, like, my brain does work differently than yours. Um, I I feel like I need these types of supports to get this work done. That is an equal part, an equal critical part here as it is to have cultures of curiosity and empathy and flexibility and leaders that are leaning in and listening. Because what will happen is if we don't create cultures where every employee, again, admin to CEO can come forward and say, hey, I'm different. That's awesome. I need different things, right? Just to kind of normalize it. If we don't have people indicating what they need, knowing that they're an expert in their own selves, we'll have a lot of frustrated people around us going, well, I don't know how to help. I don't know how to help. I don't know how to help you. I love that this isn't about being a victim. This I love the word self-advocacy. You took it upon yourself. You went and found what you needed, like obviously being an environment, but also in the separation from you're an environment that maybe isn't supportive, that isn't that empathetic, that doesn't take this time. As the individual, it's still in your power to do things differently for yourself. And I think it's really, I really like that story because it's a little easy to listen to some of this. And if you, if you are jaded, you might be like, whoa, it's a bunch of people being victims, pull, pull up your socks. <laughs> I love the sock story. So I didn't realize that that was going to go there. Well played, Tyler, well played. Uh, and, and, and yeah, well, <laughs> almost dad <laughs> joke territory there. I have to be careful. Um, and that might not be the organization for you, but that doesn't mean that there isn't, self-advocacy through self-responsibility on seeking out because these resources do exist. And if things aren't going well, sitting in it is probably not going to make it better. Going out, digging, researching, reading. I had a friend recently, late forties, one of my good buddies, we we're talking the other day and he made some comment. He goes, well, that's part of my neurodivergent, my, my neurodivergent tendencies. That's the first time I've ever heard him use the word. And we've been friends for 20 years. I was like, wait a second, you want to, you want to, you want to back that up? Like, a diagnosis? What is? Do you, I've been doing some reading and really understanding some of these behaviors that I don't like. They keep, you know, kind of getting in my way and half finished projects and, and things like that. And he's so yeah, no, I'm, I'm still working on it. I said, well, okay, behaviors that are changing. No, I'm just I'm learning right now. I'm just trying to understand it. I'm getting that. Okay, I'm not just broken. I'm not just weird. He goes, I am weird, but it's weird in a way. And it was such an interesting dialogue because he took it on himself and it just was going to slide by. And it's like, oh, no, 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 we're not going to let that happen because we've known each other forever and ever and ever. And it's just the first time it showed up. And I really appreciate it. I'm not sure how he got on the journey or where he started, but he started digging going, I need to understand why I do these things that in my late forties, I'm just getting tired of it. It just doesn't work for me anymore. I don't like living in chaos. I don't like my house being half renovated, those types of things. But the self-awareness around it was quite interesting. And it's early. So I kind of backed off because I could turn into podcast guy and start digging in, asking a million questions. But I'm like, no, no, cool. Thanks for sharing. We'll chat again and just kind of move past it. But no one was there pushing him or telling him or even supporting him. He just decided enough was enough. And I did respect that at a high level for just, I don't know what it is, but it's not what I'm happy about. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pursue it. How much, like I'm hearing you talk, at the end of the day, no matter where we are, or what organization or what family environment we're in, this is still an us opportunity, right? To take hold of it and go out there and learn. And yeah, understand. it truly is. And this is where I'll, I'll share social media has been on one hand, 
awful. It's been awful. I mean, we've got it all mm. through the pandemic. I'm sure like there's people that are like, oh my gosh, TikTok told me that I have Instagram and or TikTok told me that I have ADHD part of me or, you know, we've, we've got um, social media. <laughs> that I went to Instagram oh, yeah, to confirm I it. Yeah, I know, it. totally. It's like we've got <laughs> yeah. social media prescribing <laughs> to us like what strengths and challenges are for each of these things. And that will play a role on, on people equally on social media. We have neurodivergent people that are coming out and telling their story. We've got countless TED Talks out there and we've got amazing, amazing YouTube shorts of people saying, hey, if I was asked um, in terms of what I need in the workplace, here's what I would need. And so my invitation really is neurodiversity does not necessarily have to be about the labels. It's not really about the labels. Um, the way I present and facilitate is, is really it's about we all experience, sense, and feel, behave, present differently. And we all have different needs. And I guess from my perspective, that's the first step on your inclusion because it involves everybody, irrelevant of how they identify, right? They don't necessarily have to identify as being an ADHD or or having a, a disability, or having a, um, a sensory issue. It really just normalizes that every single person is different, is different. And there's a lot of harm in, in those labels, too, that, like the microaggressions that we hear, right? Like the, oh my god, I'm so OCD right now, or, um, oh, I lost my keys, I have like such bad ADHD, when really that's not, not really that's not somebody who has it, right? It's directly offending somebody who does. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of almost brought you, but brought to you by pop culture a little bit back to your point about social media, movies, TV, where it gets yeah. like that. Yeah. And the other thing too mm -hmm. is, um, and we talked about, about this a little bit already, but like once you've met one person with, with autism or ADHD or when one person who's autistic, you've met one person, for example, right? Like the variation is, is infinite. As much as people are infinite, <laughs> exactly to your point, we we all are unique. That this we're we're all going to fit into the eighty percent of the norm, so we can standardize and normalize. And it, the personalization that is required in so much of our world. Speaking about our devices in our hands, that personalize everything right down to what we see because we clicked on a post about a certain topic. Uh, do you find organizations in your work? are leaning into it, are like, oh, just another thing. We're too busy. Like uh, the, 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 this takes a little bit of time, but you made it sound that, yeah, but with the right mindset, this just becomes an underpinning of what you do versus, oh, we have to go off on a weekend retreat to learn about this. Uh, how's that balance where, you know, I'm listening to this as an organization and then I'm like, yeah, I believe in it, but oh man, an I, uh, uh, another thing, another thing that I just don't have time to do. How do you balance those two out in kind of your own consulting mm -hmm. organizations? So I will be honest, this is going to be a slow burn because people are like, it's, it's like you said, Tyler, they're like, yeah, no, I get it. I get it. We're all different. Um, I think organizations need tangible strategies right now. So they do need people like myself and others that can come along and say, let me do an audit of your recruitment process just to show you how it can be improved. Or maybe it's, you know, how do we create some language instead of uh, duty to accommodate, which implies that, you know, somebody has to make like a, a great sacrifice for somebody else. How do we maybe switch gears to creating a policy within our organization that respects that we all need a different adjustment at one point or another, and that shouldn't be stigmatized, right? So helping kind of like implement some, some policy from a culture perspective, and this is the big one, Efforts towards neurodiversity and neuroinclusion do not happen without psychological safety. So if, if yeah, even if there's one in the room that's like, oh, that person's in the loony bin, or oh, this person's weird, or oh, this person, like, it's, it's just not going to work. And that's why, um, in terms of like, kind of coming into this industry, it's so important for us neuroinclusion consultants to say, it's flat. You matter, you matter, you matter. Like my Oprah moment, like your brain matters and your brain matters and your brain matters, whether it's the CEO all the way down to admin. Because again, what we don't know is the CEO might be actually experiencing some major, major, major challenges, even with how they themselves are operating. It's just nobody is talking about how 
little tweaks to everybody's role or environment or could really enable their success and embrace some of the the strengths that come with um, neurodiversity as well. Creativity of thought, like the ultimate question is what happens at work when we all show up authentically or feel like we can? Hmm. Yeah. Magical, magical things in in an environment of trust and psychological safety. I appreciate like what's going to be the Petri dish that allows this to happen, a degree of psychological safety and feeling safe to be yourself at work. And it's easy to, that's an easy thing to flip off, but it is, it is, it is something that I know a lot of organizations just through this podcast, I've been chatting with people. It's coming up time and time and time again, because it's, the struggle is real. Mm -hmm. And I think you get pockets of it and then maybe it goes away. Like everything, it's like your values, they're asper, they should be aspirational. And when you miss them, you should go, oh, it didn't work out because we missed it. You got to be able to be at least, you know, communicative around that Mm -hmm. because it isn't perfect. We're humans and we're messy. (laughs) That's okay. (laughs) But how do we celebrate that with a framework? Messy as hell, I would say. Messy as hell. Hashtag messy as hell. I love it. <laughs> um, Tara, what's the, thank you. This is, oh, you give me so much to ponder and I love it. As I'm having, I just had a conversation yesterday with a facilitator that, that works with companies around psychological safety and works on building trust. And, you know, she said, she was, when you have psychological safety, you get the luxury of conflict. And without conflict, you have no growth in an organization. And then and, and, and you and I chatted today and kind of bolt another piece in and they all are joined at like the hip bones connected to the knee bone kind of thing. Right? It's so true. And I would say for all of the psychological safety practitioners out there, thank you. Thank you for doing what you do because that also sets the stage very foundationally for secondary conversations to come up where people can, can speak openly. With global stats, I know that, you know, fast forward even three to five years from now, we're going to have a world which is primarily um, very, very more neurodivergent. Right now it's 20%, but it will increase. And so yeah. organizations can take a proactive approach now. Um, I, I would say consultants can help support some of your neuro inclusion, neuro inclusion efforts. Don't think that you have to know it all. Let some of us be your guide. Let your current neurodivergent employees be your guide. Um, even if you're brave enough, you know, go out to market and post on LinkedIn. Hey, our organization is striving to be more neuroinclusive in our hiring practices. Um, we welcome the um, expertise and feedback from our future neurodivergent workforce. What would you like to see in terms of enabling you to be more successful in your recruitment practice? Just ask. Everybody has time for that five minute post uh, over that Starbucks that you're having. And I would say in addition to that, you know, as coaches, some of us are able to create safe spaces for you as leaders. If A, you're navigating how to manage somebody who has ADHD or somebody who's different and you need a safe place outside the organization to talk about it. And then again, I I would say most important is creating an invitation where self-advocacy can exist at all levels. Very, very important. I love it. And what I'm hearing loud and clear is this isn't just the flavor of the day. This isn't a fad. This isn't like, oh, this is what's popular right now. This is where things are headed. We're becoming more aware of it all the time. Three to five years from now, ignore this at your peril, like to put a little point on it. Yes, ignore this at your peril. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and I also, I guess, would want to leave everybody back to sort of um, that medical model to, to social model. You know, ADHD has the word deficit in it that kind of bugs me right being an adhd or because <laughs> i have plenty of there's a naming problem strengths, and <laughs> so do other people so i also want to have people consider what who's the talent that you're missing out on due to rigid processes right because these strengths and skills and competencies that are attached to also neurodivergent thinking is is powerful. There's creativity, there's nonlinear thinking, there's outside the box thinking, there's all sorts of different, again, human variation in how we all think, but it's been proven, you know, through many organizations that are employing neurodivergent talent specifically, they would say like, there's data to show that um, it can be, it can be very, a very huge competitive advantage. And and none of our, um, so many of our, our greatest inventions and innovations have happened due to diversity of thought, right? 
Yes, when you look at it from a historical perspective, there's lots of yes, there's some interesting nuance there. And, um, I love it. So such a such a such a holistic, warm, and approachable perspective you pro you, you created today, which I think is my whole goal of the show is that someone listens and goes, "Huh, I need to learn a bit more about that. I need to go down the rabbit hole. I need to I need to click. I need to Google. I need to do whatever." So get curious. Just get curious, and I like to spark it. You gave such a well rounded, but yet a very very approachable way to come at this. If someone wants to get a hold of you and have a conversation, because this has been amazing, what's the best way? Is it LinkedIn? Is it their website? What What's your preferred? If What's your preferward communication style in the world? Yeah, of electronic communication? I feel like I'm blasting out information all the time on LinkedIn. So feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Absolutely. Um, nice. my, my sort of preferred hashtag is normalize minds of all kinds, um, at work. That's sort of my, my shtick and my branding. And for anybody out there that's listening that, you know, again, whether you have a formal diagnosis or not, whether you have grown up with a diagnosis or not, whether you're muddling your way through the lost generation, like me, um, you know, at, at 43 now, and I'm going, oh my gosh, like, this is interesting news. Like, just like your friend, Tyler, like, just know that you are normal <laughs> yep. and that you are okay um, for any organizations mm -hmm. that are looking to kind of make that change. Remember what I was sharing around neuronormativity. That's the true challenge. Are we one size fitting all for everybody? And just be open-minded, be open-minded to getting to know people and leaning in and being curious, but yes, reach out. And uh, I'd love to, I'd love to continue to chat. <laughs>